Okay, well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third session of our eighth annual Toro University, California Social Justice and Public Health Speaker Series, hosted by the Public Health Program. My name is Gail, and I am the Program Director for the Public Health Program here at Toro University, California, and I am joined by Dr. Deirdre Wilson, who is co-coordinator of the series and will be co-moderator uh, uh, co of today's session. Uh, the topic of this year's series is Economic and Political Inequality, a Threat to Public Health, which is a follow-up from our series last year, which focused on public health and well-being in the time of COVID and racial injustice. This year's series examines those issues much more broadly with a more upstream approach and an analyzes in an analysis, ooh, pardon me, Deirdre. Pardon me. And our analysis that will explore the intersections and influences of our nation's policies, politics, and economics as, a, as critical determinants of health. So to help us understand and untangle the upstream causes, implications, opportunities, and solutions of these critical determinants, we have a five-part series with leading experts in the field of public health and social justice from across the country and state, as well as local communities right here in Solano County and today from Sacramento, Stockton, and Oakland. We are thrilled to host today's session, uh, which is the third in our series, Poverty in California, which is a panel conversation with Mayors Michael Tubbs of, Sacra of uh, Stockton, Mayor Daryl Steinberg of Sacramento, and Eleanor Buchan, who is representing Mayor Libby Schaff from Oakland, unfortunately, who has developed COVID in spite of uh, what Joe Biden has mentioned, it is still a pandemic. Um, Mayor Schaff sends her regrets. Uh, however, we are looking for conversations from uh, uh, Eleanor Michael and uh, Mayor Daryl Steinberg, who these individuals will be representing uh, Mayors for Guaranteed Income, which is a network of mayors from across the country who are advocating for guaranteed income to ensure that all Americans have an income floor. And they'll talk more about that in their presentation. All three understand all too well the serious and deep impacts of the housing and economic insecurity issues across the state of California, and more particularly how these, these policies and issues have impacted the cities that they serve and have served in. Collectively, they understand and have implemented in different phases in different cities income as a solution from Stockton to Oakland to Sacramento. We'll hear from each mayor about how offering guaranteed income and other similar solutions to communities um, who are most at risk can create health equity. From a public health perspective, we know that income inequality and poor housing are social drivers that negatively impact the health outcomes of our nation's most of our nation's most vulnerable populations. This is a social justice and a human rights issue. So we are excited to hear from these three presenters about how these strategies can, ch can really change the trajectory of people's lives. But before we begin with today's session, even though we're all meeting virtually, we're continuing to meet virtually, we're all currently sitting on or standing on what is uh, indigenous territory, and with the permission of Corina Gold, Ohlone leader, I would like to acknowledge that Turo University, California sits on the traditional territory of the Karkin Olani, Ohlone, who lo lovingly stewarded this land for generations. Now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. De Deirdre Wilson, who is the chair of the Community Health for Action Concentration for some housekeeping, and she will introduce our first panelist. Thank you, Dr. Cummings. I'd like to uh, make our students aware that this is, of course, a course, and uh, you need to be uh, lo logged in under your own uh, webinar link. I'd also like to instruct you to go to the Canvas uh, course to complete the survey at the end. Uh, this is a Zoom recording, uh, so I would like to make everyone aware that this session is being recorded. If you are interested in continuing education units, medical education units, I have placed the link and the code for today's activity uh, in the chat, and I will also place it later on during the session. If you're interested in 
uh, receiving the Social Justice Lecture Series Digital Badge. We have a new program that will allow you to receive a badge for our previous, for viewing the previous series. And that information can also be found in the chat. So now I'd like to introduce uh, one of our first mayors, Mayor Emeritus Michael Tubbs. In 2016, he was elected mayor of Stockton at 26 years of age. He was the city's first African-American mayor and the youngest mayor of any major city in American history. As mayor, Tubbs was lauded for his leadership and innovation and raised over $20 million to create the Stockton Scholars, a universal scholarship and mentorship program for Stockton students. Additionally, he piloted the first mayor-led guaranteed income pilot in the country. Currently, he is the special advisor to California Go Governor Gavin Newsom for economic mobility and opportunity, um, the founder of the Mayors for Guaranteed Income and the founder of End Poverty in California. Under his leadership, Stockton was named an All-America City in 2017 and 2018 by the National Civic League. The city saw a 40% drop in homicides in 2018 and 2019, led the state of California in the decline of officer-involved shootings in 2019, and was named the second most fiscally healthy city in California. Additionally, it was recognized as one of the most healthy cities in the nation and was featured in an HBO documentary, Stockton on My Mind. Mayor Tubbs was also mentioned as one of Fortune's top 40 under 40 and Forbes 30 under 30. Mayor Libby Shaft, I'm sorry, um, 30 under 30. Please welcome Mayor Emeritus Tubbs. Who sent you that long bio? I got to talk to people. That was that's longer than the time I spent in office. Um, I, you time. know, I, I had to read it all. It was just oh, no. too wonderful. You should have seen that. That was terrible. <laughs> but th 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 thanks so much for having me. Um, and thank you to all the students who have logged in uh, for this amazing conversation. Mayor Steinberg, when I was a mayor, was a, a mentor mayor to me. So when I've, I've always admired the way he leads and finds solutions and consensus. And Mayor Schaff was my partner in crime on all things um, radical. So, so always happy to be in conversation with them. And just to set some context, I think what's most interesting is the stuff that's happening right now. So I'm just going to do like a brief overview of sort of how do we get to this moment where we have over 90 mayors across the country sign up for Mayors for Guaranteed Income. We have a state level pilot for, for guaranteed income programs in the state. We have mayors like Mayor Steinberg leading on guaranteed income in California. We have counties now doing guaranteed income because it didn't start like that. So in 2017, I was just elected my first year as mayor and really felt that poverty was the driving force behind many of the issues we had, not just in the city of Stockton, but in the state of California and indeed this nation. And I would sit hours in meetings about housing affordability and hours in meetings about educational attainment and hours in meetings about violence. And it felt like we were all talking about poverty without talking about poverty. So we talked about increasing police departments. We talked about building more housing. We talked about um, more after school programs and all those things um, could be or should be vetted as possible solutions, but not to the issue, the structural and, and root issue, root cause issue of poverty. Now I had remembered studying Dr. King when I was a student and that when the last things he called for before he was assassinated was this idea of a guaranteed income. And his idea was much more radical and true Kingian fashion. It was to be paid at median income and index for inflation, meaning something much larger than a small $500, $750,000 a month. That was always interested as to what happened. Like, why was that never taught as part of his legacy? And why has that never been done? So it's kind of in that spirit, I decided to start the Guaranteed Income Pilot in Stockton in 2017. In 2017, this was pre-pandemic. This was pre my friend Andrew Yang running for president. It was just this 27-year-old mayor saying, you know what, I think we have, we have to think differently. And part of the, the, the rationale for doing it wasn't even from knowing that this, was in, this would be a right answer. And that's why we set up evaluation and evaluation partners. 
to evaluate and see what works. But it was really born out of the spirit of this is not working. The status quo is not working. And that's just talking about it or being frustrated about it or tweeting about it's not enough. And I share that particularly with the students to let you all know that part of leading and part of leadership, especially in the realm of public health, has to be about looking at the status quo and daring that it should be different. Like it's not enough to recite disparities. It's not enough to talk about disparities. Like those of us with access and power, privilege and resources have to be thinking of solutions. So long story short, in Stockton, we did a guaranteed income pilot. We gave 125 people randomly assigned throughout the city. 75% um, of the city qualified because the only qualification was that you had to live in a census tract at or below the city's median income, which 75% of the city did. And we gave folks $500 a month for two years to, to test it out. I had no idea a pandemic was coming or anything like that, but we knew that poverty was like a pre-existing condition, that, that if folks had a hard time before a pandemic, like I don't see how they're gonna be better off during a pandemic. And uh, so, so we put that in place and we had it evaluated. And what we saw were a couple of things. Um, number one, in terms of health, we saw actual health impacts. We saw that those who received the guaranteed income compared to those who didn't, those who received it, who received it, received it, excuse me, had their stress levels, cortisol levels go down, uh, and their stress levels go down according to the Kessler scale um, versus those who didn't receive the guaranteed income, which I was really excited about. Like, wow, we, and, and I think um, Dr. Cummings mentioned this, that we know that there's an that, that social determinants of health, one of them being economics, like money and how stress and anxiety can lead to poor health outcomes. So I was happy to see an impact there just for a short two-year intervention. We also saw on employment, you know, everybody was like, give people money, even if it's $500, they're going to stop working. They're like, you know what, this $30,000 I'm making, skip it. I'm going to make this $500 and that's it and stay home all day. And we found that actually to be a lie. We saw that those who received the guaranteed income were two times more likely than those who didn't to move from part-time to full-time work and two times less likely to be unemployed. And that's because we also know that cash prohibits people from going to work, which is wild to think about. But it costs money to go to work. If you're a security guard, it costs money to get your uniform dry cleaned. If you're a nurse, same thing. And it costs money in terms of transportation. It costs money in terms of childcare. It costs money in terms of food, et cetera, et cetera. So we saw that just a little bit of cash actually unlocked people's ability to transition from part-time to full-time work and, and to find employment. And we also found that people spend money the way you and I spend money because people are people. And one of the biggest lies we tell ourselves are that the differential we see in wealth and income is solely because of ability, is solely because of merit, it's solely because of effort. It's a lie. That, look, at, turn it up. That is not true. Like just because someone has less money than you does not mean you're smarter than them, and does not mean you make better choices than them. And I think that was something hard for people to reckon with. But I was like, yeah, they spend money how you would spend money on their kids, on transportation. So like ninety-seven percent of it went to like stuff that like makes sense, and only three percent. I hate to have to say this stat, but I do. Less than 3% went to drugs and alcohol, meaning that sort of chemical dependency and substance use disorder. It's probably at least, it's probably di distributed amongst the income spectrum anyway, but this really illustrates like, like uh, folks aren't struggling because they um they they, they lack money. So I'll, I'll conclude and, and pass it with just two closing thoughts um, before we have a, a, the Q&A at the end. Number one, one of the biggest things we had to push back against was this idea of dignity being attached to work and people saying, well, you're just giving people money, you're reducing the dignity of work. But, and, and I would argue, I think that's part of the issue and that's part why this work is important, that we have to evolve as a society that understands that dignity isn't attached to what you produce, it's attached to personhood. And if we actually attach dignity to people, they would work in more dignified conditions. There's nothing dignified about the folks passing out today in the Amazon warehouses because it's too hot and not be able to use the bathroom. There's nothing dignified about people working two or three two or three jobs and still can't pay rent. There's nothing dignified about working yourself literally to death and having nothing to pass on to the next generation. There's nothing dignified in working without union protections. There's nothing dignified as retail workers have to do and work without knowing their full schedule for the week. And 
The issue is that they lack dignity. They have dignity. Our workplaces need to be more reflective of that. I think guaranteed income is a useful tool to push that very important paradigm shift in conversation. And lastly, I'll end with a story of a, of a gentleman named Tomas, who was one of our guaranteed income recipients. So I remember interviewing him for our big like release of the first spending data. And I said, well, what'd you do with the money? We all want to know. And he said, I went to an interview. And at first he said that, and I was like, oh my gosh, this experiment's over. We are done for. He's spending money on dumb stuff. I said, so what did you mean? You went to an interview, you paid $500 for an interview. And he said, no, I work part-time and I live paycheck to paycheck. So I've always wanted to apply for a different job, but I could never take the risk of losing two hours of work to even go to an interview. And I was like, wow. Ah, and then because he had the guaranteed income, he was able to take a risk, go to an interview, take a little bit of time off work to go to the interview, end up getting a full-time job, making more money, spending, let, making more money, working less hours and actually spending time with his kids. And he talks about like, now he knows who his kids are. He knows his daughter is a scientist and has been able to take her to Monterey Bay Aquarium and able to buy her telescopes and stuff. And he said, I had no idea. I was numb. I was angry. I was just working all day, coming home to sleep, waking up, working a double. I had no idea who my kids are, much less who I was. And sort of how something as small as $500 for two years a month was able to unlock a whole new humanity and, and, and fatherhood for him. And I think that's what's exciting about this moment. And that's what's exciting about the leadership of the mayors is that we're really just calling into question and saying, as this country is apt to do, like, what does the 21st century safety net look like? Like, like, sure, some things are good, but some of the fundamentals are off. Can we get better? And why would anyone want to live in a, in a world where there's poverty, when it's avoidable? <laughs> like, 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 what, like what, what does it serve to have this inequality and this poverty just makes everyone stressed, anxious, angry at each other? And it gives mayors and leaders gray hair trying to solve these very thorny issues. So, um, again, incredibly proud. Now we have 90 mayors, including Mayor Steinberg, Mayor Mayor Schaff, who have taken it and have ran it and done their own things and thought about different questions that can be asked. It's been really exciting to watch and see sort of how one seed has become like a real movement and a movement rooted in justice, a movement, a movement rooted in universal dignity and a movement um, rooted in really American traditions and values in terms of opportunity and freedom and at least having a baseline to work off. Thank you so much, Mayor Tubbs. We really appreciate providing you providing the context of uh, the Guaranteed Income Program and kind of your rationale why. We have a couple of questions before we move on to the next um, speaker, and then we're going to have kind of some some uh, general conversation. But I thought it would be important to um, ask this question: um, Was the opportunity also awarded to those that were unhoused? In the it depends on your definition of unhoused. So in the Stockton demonstration, we sent anonymous letters to addresses. Um, but some of the, uh, there's a definition of homelessness as in, that includes like couch surfing or folks who are living in, in, in different locales. So we don't have an official account of how many folks were unhoused in the Stockton demonstration. But what's interesting is that so many of the other pilots going on now really focus on that. So Mayor Hancock in Denver, who's just prior mayor for guaranteed income, has a guaranteed income pilot just focus on unhoused individuals and seeing if kind of cash will allow people to navigate from temporary to permanent housing. So eagerly looking forward to the results of that. And if I was reelected, that was going to be my second pilot. It's going to be one focus on the individuals experiencing homelessness and one focus on survivors of domestic violence. So, so or it's going to be an intersection of, of, of those who are in domestic violence shelters and seeing sort of if cash was a way to allow those women um, to start their lives over it and be truly safe. So I'm going to reserve the, the next questions just to let our audience know uh, there are several other questions, uh, but it looks like many of them are focused towards um, Mayor Tubbs, but also could be answered by the other panelists. So I'd like to open it up to uh, our next panelist, uh, which is Mayor Steinberg. Thank you so much um, for having me. It's a great honor um, and uh, and uh, I uh, bar to follow Mayor Tubbs, who um, demonstrates that the power of a big idea um, can take hold and resonate throughout 
the entire country. And uh, I'm proud to be a, a member of uh, of this organization of mayors supporting uh, the guaranteed income movement. And we'll talk a little bit about what we're doing in my city. But I may I wanted to step back just for a moment. Um, I've been mayor for six years, and prior to that. I led the state Senate in California and was a legislator for 14 years and um, had the privilege of authoring uh, the Mental Health Services Act in California, which is the tax on million dollar earners to fund uh, public mental health passed by the voters in 2004 it generates $4 billion a year um, in services for people with serious mental illnesses. And it's interesting because that was 20 years ago. And in some ways, the mental health movement uh, has now caught up uh, where as 20 years ago, no one was talking much about the brain or about mental illness. Uh, stigma, as we call it, or discrimination was still very thick um, and it has not been completely cured today. But, um, in part because of COVID, in part because of the fragility of the social contract and the way uh, people live, uh, mental health has emerged, especially among children, but among adults as well, as, a, uh, as finally a high priority public health issue in our country. And so, you know, there's a lot of science and a lot of programs and a lot of interventions but when we really step back and ask the question, what is the fine line between mental health and mental illness? And, and let me explain that. The idea that uh, mental illness occurs oftentimes where people have not been able to attend to their mental well being or their mental health. You don't need a lot of science to tell us that abject poverty and the stress that that brings on people, on families, of heads of households, on children is maybe the largest contributing factor to mental illness or the lack of adequate mental health. Uh, and that's just common sense. When people um, have stability in their lives, including economic stability, when families are cared for, when anxiety, and we all live with anxiety, but when anxiety becomes unreasonable because you are worried about whether or not you're going to be able to feed yourself or your family or be able to have a roof over your head, um, then, suffering, including mental health and mental illness, become much more relevant. And so I look at this chapter of my public service as mayor, but this opportunity to work with Mayor Tubbs and Mayor Schaff, and please give her our best, I hope she's feeling better, um, as actually an opportunity to expand the mental health agenda in California and in the country. Um, because providing families with that economic stability is, um, is a social determinant of health and of mental health. And in my city, we are, um, we are all in. Um, we just need to find more money. Um, we started out with a grant from uh, the United Way back in 2020 and from June of 2021 through June of 2023 uh, in the city and the county. Um, we are investing a minimum income of $300 a month uh, for 24 months to 100 households chosen from um, a, a low socio economic demographic neighborhood of Sacramento County. It's amounted to $720,000 in direct payment to residents. 72% are women heads of household. 80% of the payments went to households of two or more. 
That means on average, we're talking about heads of households with income of $27,000 uh, or less. The average cost, of course, of a two bedroom apartment in Sacramento, we used to be uh, proud of our, our extreme affordability. And now in part because we're a great place to live and we've got a lot of people moving up from the Bay Area and elsewhere. Um, we are living with the, with the negative side of growth and becoming cosmopolitan and all those good things is that we're becoming rapidly unaffordable like the Bay Area. And so the average cost of a two-bedroom apartment is $2,300 a month. So how do our families afford to live? Well, this pilot project is showing the way. 79% of our participants spend the funds on basic needs. 71% um, use the funds partially for utilities, 64% for transportation, be able to get to and from work, and 50% directly on rent. And so obviously we're so enthused about this that we took $750,000 of additional money from our American Rescue Plan uh, uh, award and put it into expanding this program within the city of Sacramento. We haven't implemented yet because thanks again to Mayor Tubbs and Governor, Governor Newsom, they put significant resources into the state budget to allow for ma uh, matching funds for cities who are stepping up. And so we want to try to see, Mayor Tubbs, if we can match our $750,000, you know, threefold or fourfold if we can, and, and serve more families. That's a very, uh, you know, subtle way of, of lobbying here. Uh, but mm, all, like I knew getting on a call with you is we lobby for something. So I'm already uh, taking notes in there. That's good. All, all for the cause. But that's not all. That's not all. We decided to take another $2 million um, of our ARP money and put it into a guaranteed income pilot for specifically focused on our creative economy and artists in our city who are struggling to make ends meet. We believe in our city that building up the creative economy, the diverse creative economy is an essential part of growing our city. It's the good part, the fun part of life, the vitality, right? The energy, the creativity, and yet it's very hard to attract um, I, not just young in terms of chronological age, but, but emerging artists uh, because the cost of living again is too high. And so we're gonna put this $2 million towards uh, earmarking for 225 artists in Sacramento to get a guaranteed paycheck for the next two years at $450 per month. We're gonna launch this spring. And uh, we're very, very excited to take a sector-based approach uh, and to, um, and to uh, watch that blossom uh, in the capital city of California. Finally, I just want to go back to this issue of poverty. And I know one of the, the students asked about homelessness, which, of course, is the issue uh, of our time here in California and certainly in all of our major cities. I wish I, I could say that I don't, I wish I could not say that I spend, God, more than half of my time on these vexing, vexing issues. And you know, there are a lot of reasons for homelessness and it's complex, but guess what? It isn't that complex in a way because the fundamental reason why we have such an increase in our homeless population is because we have a, a, a growing and increasing uh, numbers of people who can't afford to make ends meet, period, end of story. Low wages combined with high housing prices, sometimes you know, combined with pre-existing vo health vulnerabilities on the mental health or sometimes on the substance abuse side. But there are a lot of people who are fragile and housed who are, um, now fragile and unhoused. And that's economic, largely. And so I'm hopeful that this guaranteed income movement can apply in a more broad fashion to the people who are out on our streets, um, combined with changing the law in the United States of America and in California and make housing not just a human right, 
but a legal right. Uh, because until it's a legal right, the systems and the, and the private sector and the government, all responsible for it, are not going to act with the levels of urgency, collaboration, and coordination that we need and that the people who are suffering uh, need even more. So appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, uh, Mayor Steinberg. You got into your conversation so quickly, I didn't get an opportunity to actually introduce you properly. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> keep, keep, it, keep, keep it long. Just keep it long. <laughs> but, uh, and yeah. I, I do understand you, you have to leave us a little bit early, so yes. I appreciate you, you kind of getting started and also just want to uh, lift up and appreciate you uh, in your discussion, talking about the intersection between poverty, you know, economic stability and mental health. Obviously, that's important, and and both of these conversations really looking at you know poverty as a pre-existing condition. So I think that's a really important thing to kind of highlight, especially for uh, many of our clinical folks who are on this call, but also as a social determinant of of health. So again, as uh, you 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 said uh, very articulately, it's it's complicated, but it's not. Um, and so looking at sort of these pra very practical practical solutions moving forward um, are, you know, is a really progressive way of, of looking at having, having, building health equity. And um, I think we will have a, an opportunity to answer a couple of questions before you skedaddle. Okay. Um, Dr. Wilson, do you have them queued up? I do. Um, as someone previously in Congress, what obstacles do you foresee in making housing uh, an inalienable right? So I was not in Congress, but thank you for the promotion. I was I was um, the president of the state Senate for six years, and I was state legislator, assembly and Senate for 14 years in total. So, uh, and I love the legislature, by the way, in California, because uh, you can really get a lot done. What are the obstacles to making housing an inalienable right? Well, um, the reason stated is that it would be too costly to guarantee everyone a dignified place to live. And of course, you know what the retort is to that. Oh my God, what is the economic cost, the social cost, the human cost of allowing what goes on uh, on our streets uh, and in our communities, um, it's become the political issue, you just talk for your politics, the political issue of our time. I maintain that when something really matters in society, we require it. It's become so embedded in our culture now, we don't even think about it, that we require free public education for every child and thus, we require the construction of public schools and right on. I mean, that's just like a given. Housing people or providing mental health care to people, that is a governmental and societal option. And we reap what we sow because we live with the results. Um, and it's not about bad people or bad leaders even, it isn't that. It's about systems respond to what is required. Um, if something is required, then cities, if it's required for cities and counties to work together and produce X amount of housing or entitle people with mental health issues who are unsheltered to get the care and help they need, if that's a legal requirement, it's not going to be perfect, but we're going to get a lot further than where we all are now when everybody sort of, you know, uh, quote, does the best they can, but not nearly enough. I feel so strongly about this. And it is a it is a statement that our society makes from our country to our state, to our cities, that we do not make housing a, uh, a legal right um, and or mental health care a legal right. It really is, no matter our crocodile tears about how much we say we care, is belied by the fact that there is no legal requirement for us to care for the people who are hurting the most. And I'm just tired of it. And so we're trying. Um, the governor's care courts, controversial as it was, actually embedded in it an obligation for counties to provide mental health care to 
people uh, on our streets who are who who are the subject of these petitions in my city, where we have a ballot measure that would begin the process of requiring the city to uh, to provide sh at least shelter of some kind to people. But we got a long way to go, and um, if it matters, just like civil rights matters, just like public education matters, then we need to legally require it. And then, by the way, the money will follow um, and we'll find ways to be more innovative around efficiency housing, manufactured housing. We'll build it less expensively, more uh, and, and quicker. Thank you, uh, Mayor Steinberg. And um, just so that we uh, can give you time to get away when you do, I'm going to ask this question to all three mayors, but I want to ask it of you first. Um, because you're, you're speaking with primarily individual students um, and community folks with a public health background, public health training, and as well as clinicians, my question is how can students and public health practitioners um, support some of these efforts. Obviously, these are, these are very new and progressive types of proposals. What, um, how can, can these students contribute to moving these, these um, uh, movements forward? Well, I know that um, politics in some quarters is sort of a dirty phrase or dirty word, but um, you gotta get involved in politics. You, you have to get involved in public policy you have to elect good people um, like like the two mayors I'm with here today who are, you know, willing to step out um, and willing to provoke the discussion. I mean, and not everybody, you know, there's so many different ways to get engaged or involved. Some people are policy experts. Some people like the political side. It's OK, whatever your strength is, but it, it's uh, or your interest is, but it's to be engaged in the forming of public policy and not let others do it for you. Uh, there's just nothing more important. The world belongs to those who choose to dive in. Um, and 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 someone once said to me, there are two kinds of people in politics and public policy in life, the short termers and the long timers. The short termers are those who get involved and see just how darn hard it is and how frustrating it can be and how it's two steps forward, one step back, maybe one step forward and two steps back sometimes. And then they give up and say, I, it's too hard. And then there are the long-termers who just stay with it year after year, decade after decade for their cause. And they get the privilege of being able to look back after 10 years, 20 years, 30 years and say, oh my God, look at how far we've come. I mean, who thought we would have marriage equality in the United States of America? I didn't when I started 30 years ago. Um, who thought we'd have all this money for mental health? I mean, who thought we'd be talking about guaranteed income? Change does happen, not the way we want, not as fast, but you can make change and help so many people if you choose to get engaged in the stuff that sometimes seems uh, unattractive, but is but it's really necessary and important to bend the world towards justice. Thank you so much, Mayor Steinberg. Um, now we really appreciate your time and hope Thank you, you can all. stay, stay for all. a few minutes um, as uh, we continue with uh, Oakland's story. And I'd like to introduce um, the Deputy Chief of Staff and Legislative Director for Mayor Libby Schaaf's office, Eleanor Buchan, and she will, uh, she's sitting in for Mayor Schaaf today. Thank you so much, Dr. Wilson. Um, it's really just an honor to be here uh, tonight with all of you and particularly with Mayors Tubbs and Steinberg. Um, Eleanor Buchan, Deputy Chief of Staff. I'm also the lead for the Mayor's Office on Oakland Resilient Families. Um, so I'm really sorry that Mayor Schaff couldn't be here today. She is just so passionate about this work. And also, I mean, honestly, these are two of her most favorite mayors. So I'm, I know she feels sad to miss this opportunity to, to talk with you all today. Um, 
I'm going to nerd out for a little bit as a staffer, and I'm going to show slides and maybe go into a little more of the, the nitty gritty, but I'll, I'll try to get through them quickly. Um, I think I can start sharing my screen here. Let's see. Am I sharing? Can you? All right. That sounds good. Um, I mean, Oakland's connection with this really, um, you know, my mayor was really inspired by Mayor Tubbs. Uh, mayor Tubbs reached out um, back in 2020 um, to talk about his vision. And it was really, you know, a paradigm shift and an, an alternative vision for how we really address poverty and address the racial wealth gap in this country. So she joined early on with that. At the time, the C demonstration in Stockton was in full swing. And I think we were just really excited about the opportunity, again, for thinking about this and thinking about addressing longstanding inequalities in a fresh new way. Um, one story that I'll tell that I think Mayor Tubbs has heard this one a few times. And honestly, I was a little worried you were gonna use it today, so. <laughs> Um, a, a story that really crystallized this for us in Oakland and helped us understand how important uh, this idea of just unrestricted cash support was uh, an issue that came up when through our Keep Oakland House program. So that's a program that you can, as Mayor Steinberg talked about, was really trying to get of the homeless ahead of the homelessness crisis and keep folks from falling into homelessness. One of the families that we were working with there, um, they were behind in their rent. They were at risk of getting evicted. It was an elderly mother and her adult son. Um, the son was the main supporter for the family, and he was developmentally disabled. And when the case manager started talking to this family, and trying to figure out how in the world they could still keep them in their housing, because we know all of the, the trauma and the terrible impacts that happen once someone loses stable housing. They realized that the uh, dis disabled gentleman worked as a security guard and he had been fired from his job because he kept showing up in a dirty uniform. He was wearing a dirty uniform because the family's washing machine had broken down. And because of his disabilities, he was not able to go to the public laundromat. So after this realization, the program was able to buy this family a washing machine to talk to the employers and reinstate this gentleman at work, um, thereby avoiding all of the you know, potential negative impacts. And I think that really, you know, for us, there is no public program that gives people free washing machines. And at the end of the day, and I say this as someone who's worked in policy for the last 15 years, the people who know best what a family needs to get out of poverty is the family themselves. And I think that's really like at the crux of this model is that how do we get out of the way? How do our programs, how does government get out of the way and just give people the tools that they need to empower themselves? Um, there's definitely just a beauty and a simplicity to guaranteed income. So I'm going to talk a little bit um, about our program in Oakland and again, talk a little bit of the nitty gritty um, and then see if there's questions that come up at the end. So let me see here. I... Mayor Tubbs talked a little bit about Dr. King and the early roots of this idea of guaranteed income. And for us in Oakland, it's uh, a new idea, but also an old idea. So one that actually was part of the 10 point platform of the Black Panther Party. Um, this idea that every person needed to have bas a basic floor of income. It also, I'll talk a little about this later, but one of our nonprofit partners that we work with has been doing work here in Oakland for the last 30 years with a really a focus on a strength-based approach to alleviating poverty. Um, Oakland is a beautiful, very diverse city, but it is also a city facing um, tremendous racial disparities. Um, in Oakland, the median household income for a white family is three times higher than that for an African-American family. 
um, African American Oaklanders are three times more likely to live in poverty than white families, and roughly two thirds of our Latin, our Latino, and African American households do not have three months worth of living expenses in savings or assets. That, and I will say, um, these statistics are from before the pandemic, so I can't even just speak to what to what they are now. Um, this data is from something called the Oakland Equity Indicators, and that is work that we have done to really take a look at um, a wide variety of indicators, housing, economic, public services, public health across the city and really use like a data driven approach um, to all of our city services. Um, and as I mean, I think most of the students know here and I'm kind of preaching to the choir, but we see a lot of those same disparities when we look at health outcomes. So. What I snagged here was just, um, it shows on a map, uh, life expectancy across the city of Oakland. And you can see here, there's just, you know, I thought this was a good way of kind of summing up a lot of the other um, health indicators, but a huge discrepancy from the Oakland Hills to the flatlands. And again, the flatlands, we're seeing more folks of color, lower incomes, um, higher rates of asthma, we see a lot of other, when we looked at the COVID rates, we're seeing some of the same clusters here. And, you know, not surprisingly, it looks a lot like the redlining maps when you look further back. So we are looking at decades and decades of disinvestment and systemic racism. And I'm not saying that guaranteed income is this silver bullet that is solving all of these things, but it's part of why I think we were just so eager for a new, fresh idea another tool in the toolkit um, to start addressing some of the things that our city was, was working on. So um, we were thankfully um, able to partner with some other organizations and secure private funding. So our Oakland Resilient Families pilot is entirely privately funded. Um, we uh, partnered with up Together, which is a nonprofit that's been in Oakland for a while. Um, again, they've got a, a philosophy about really empowering families to help themselves. Um, so again, really looking at ways to change kind of the deficit-driven punitive um, systems that we have and really lifting up people's assets, ingenuity, and resources. We also partnered with Oakland Thrives, which is a collaborative, organization that focuses on outcomes for children and families. That was really important for us because we have the school district, um, Alameda County Public Health, uh, Alameda First Five, a number of CBOs and providers that helped sort of anchor what we wanted to see in terms of a program for our community and also helped, it, helped a lot with the community outreach for our program. Uh, the main points of our pilots is a focus on uh, BIPOC families, so Black, Indigenous, people of color families with low incomes and at least one child under the age of 18. And I think Mayor Schaff was just, she's really passionate about working on issues affecting children. We also in Oakland have an Oakland Promise, a scholarship fund and funds to help um, baby bonds that, that every baby gets um, some uh, a savings account. Um, and just about the opportunity to really help young people, um, right? Because when parents are struggling, kids are struggling. So we were interested in seeing what the dynamics were um, of starting a pilot for uh, that population. So we looked at doing, so our pilot is $500 a month, for 18 months, and we are actually serving 600 families in Oakland. So again, I have a lot of nitty gritty here and I'll, I will show this and talk about it briefly and then uh, we will move forward. But our, um, I thought it might be interesting kind of our research design. We actually have two separate cohorts in Oakland and we are midstream basically. Uh, the first cohort is going to be wrapping up at the end of this year. This cohort is really focused on about a one square mile area in East Oakland. So it's an area um, that uh, is 
largely African American and Latino. Um, we see relatively high poverty rates, um, doesn't have as many assets, community assets and infrastructure as other places in the city. Um, and we were interested in looking uh, not only at the individual impacts, but what the impacts were for the community. So it's 300 families from that uh, one square mile area. There also is a component of a social capital network. So through Up Together, they are all connected. And that is a way for folks to offer resources and share information with each other. Um, so that is in progress. The other phase is one that we are doing in partnership with the Center for a Guaranteed Income, which is affiliated with Mayors for a Guaranteed Income. And we, um, this one is a citywide, so it is not geographically limited as far as the city. Uh, again, focused on families. And there we looked at um, some of the research is focused more at the educational outcomes for children and housing stability, as we talked about. That's a huge issue for our um, city. It's also being looked at in conjunction with pilots across the city, across the country, because it's in conjunction with the Center for Guaranteed Income. And it is a randomized controls trial. So it's really like the highest level of academic rigor for an evaluation. Um, so I just wanted to touch really briefly, we don't have the full results of uh, either of these pilots yet. Like I said, they're in full swing right now. Uh, the first phase has received about $7,500 so far. It's going to wrap up in December. The second phase has received about $4,500. Um, what we do know so far is we have some of the demographics information, and we feel pretty good that this is fairly reflective of the communities that we're serving in Oakland. Um, a strong majority identified as women. I think uh, it was like 80% of the um, folks that applied for the program were female. Um, we also have basically just some um, anecdotal information at this point. And that um, from the social platform where folks have been participating, uh, about 71% of folks were participating. The largest, and oftentimes there's offers of help on those social platforms. And not surprisingly, the, the most frequent request and offer were around uh, caregiving. Um, so that's something that we would expect with families with children, um, particularly also for with households and taking care of children or older adults or other folks. Here are just some of the um, quotes from things that people have posted on their um, shared platform. So folks sharing about job information, um, sharing about their own personal goals, sharing about you know a desire to exercise. Um, but looking at sort of how folks can support themselves in the community. And I think, you know, the other aspect of this work that Mayor Tubbs talked about a lot and that is really critical, I think, is the narrative change work. So there's the, the nuts and bolts policies that we're working on, but there's also just changing the perceptions about poverty um, and you know, attaching dignity to just being a person, not to necessarily having a job. Um, so it's just been a great opportunity for us to really um, learn from the folks that are in our pilot. We've actually been working with a communications firm also to understand some of the preconceptions in the community and ways that we can really lift up the benefits of guaranteed income. Um, and so some of those takeaways have been really lifting up the people directly benefiting from it. Um, understanding how that income is helping other aspects, so things like housing and education, um, how it connects to other issues. Um, and I think, you know, the, the mayor has been able to actually spend some time. These are the three folks that if, are featured in the Oakland side article, that if you haven't had a chance, is a great opportunity to hear about how people are personally experiencing the pilot. And there's a lot of just takeaways um, from their stories. Uh, Alicia Rowe has been um, just an amazing um, participant. She's taking care of her grandson and her adult son. 
and has just shared that this has really given her some momentum to move forward. I think one thing that's really interesting is, you know, she she applied for the program. She was selected for the program. She received a card in the mail. And she said the whole time she did not believe it was real. She did not believe that there was some program that was just going to give her five hundred dollars a month. She held on to it for two months because she didn't want to go to the store and have her card turned down. She eventually went. The thing the family needed was that their microwave hadn't been working for months, and she used the card and bought the family a microwave. But I think that just tells us a lot about how far we have to go in terms of just building trust in the community. Um, and again, I think that's some of the the changes. So as you know, with the question that was asked before about how people can can get involved in this work, you know, I do think there are policy levers. After this, you know, these are pilots and we're excited about just the scale of mayors for guaranteed income of being able to like weave not only the, the data and the evaluations together, but also the storytelling um, to push for some federal changes, because really the federal government is, I think, where the funding needs to come for this. I think there was just great research on the child tax credit. Um, I think some of the studies that were saying, it, I think it lowered the poverty rate for children by like 30%. So, you know, we've seen these examples. And so there's there's more policy advocacy work to be done. And there's just more conversations with friends and family um, just to, to really address some of the myths of the meritocracy that a lot of us grew up with. Um, so with that, I will stop sharing and uh, turn it back over to you. Thank you so much, Ms. Buchan. Uh, we would like to uh, just kind of open it up for Q&A. We know that um, your time is limited, but we want to make sure that uh, we have an opportunity to ask you all some questions. There are quite a few that are starting to fill the queue. Um, one question was related to uh, all of the cities, uh, and it's it's related to incarceration rates and and the kind of the intersection between incarceration rates and um, poverty. So how can uh, incarceration rates be improved in, in all three cities uh, as related to poverty? Is there a link? Mayor Tubbs or Eleanor? I'm going to okay. defer to Mayor Tubbs because he does these things all the time. I'm going to listen to your answer first. <laughs> no, no, I was going to, um, I was quiet coming to make sure I understood the question. So the question was about sort of, and correct me if I'm wrong, but can guaranteed income programs help with issues of incarceration? Yes. And have you all used that as a metric of measure? Um, well, we know sort of. We know that correlation is not causation, but we also know that sort of crime is um, impacted by like social and economic status poverty. And I say crime because it depends on sort of what crimes we're looking for, who's doing the enforcement. What, like, and so so I, I, I'm hesitant to say that those who have less money are more likely to commit crimes, but I am think it's factual to say those who have less more less money are more likely to be caught committing crimes. And that sort of criminality is kind of actually distributed amongst the, the, the income spectrum in, in many respects. Um, but no, but I think what's powerful about guaranteed income is its simplicity. Like it helps with a lot of problems, but it's a tool designed to solve the issue of income volatility, of people not having enough cash. And because of that, there's other good things that come with that, but sort of a, a, a guaranteed income in and of itself isn't the answer for mass incarceration. Like part of that, the tool for mass incarceration will also have to be looking at the carceral state, looking at the fees, penalties, um, enforcement, et cetera, that creates pipelines to, 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 to prison and it creates pipelines to incarceration. So very long winded answer to say, I think guaranteed income helps, but I think for to deal with the issue of mass incarceration, it's a guaranteed income plus, and it has to be, a guaranteed income, but also something that deals with the system of mass incarceration. Thank you so much. That, that was a great uh, explanation. And Ms. Buchan? Thanks. 
Um, well, I was just curious. I was thinking about it also just on the other side. And um, I think, you know, one thing that has been just a huge uh, learning opportunity for me is seeing um, through Mayors for a Guaranteed Income, all of the different angles that cities are taking. So like I said, we're doing families with children. And I am curious, you know, Mayor Tubbs, if there, you know, if there are um, pilots folks on focused on folks who are formerly incarcerated. Like I'm, I'm thinking about it more as a tool too for folks that are really, you know, ramping up their life, coming back, um, re-entering um, after being incarcerated. Because again, I think what what's compelling about this is like you can really kind of see hopefully as these pilots unfold and the evaluations are done wh where there's really like a huge impact and that strikes me as a population with so many barriers to employment where there could be a huge opportunity to just provide sort of a basis of support to help folks get back on their feet yeah no there's one right. um we're supporting in gainesville florida um as part of marriage guarantee income that's focused just on uh, returning citizens and what's interesting about their pilot is like even if someone given what recidivism is even if someone in the program ends up being back into the carceral system, they're still eligible for the guaranteed income um, as, as part of sort of stabilizing while they're they're right behind bars. But I think the major learning from just outside looking in from 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 that watching their work is that the cash helps, but there's so many like it almost sets up said policy for failure if the and that's like you said this, but I think people would be like, oh, we just need to, there's this one thing is going to solve this. This, this 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 problem or set of problems that being formerly incarcerated poses, and I think it's been very instructive that the cash helps. It's a huge leg up, but there's also other supports and things um, um, needed. But I'm excited to see sort of how what their final evaluation looks like. And then I know there's a group in Oakland Brown Works Collaborative. There's a group in Oakland I spoke with like six months ago, like outside of city government that was thinking about doing something focused just on returning citizens. And I'm not sure where they were with fundraising or if they got off the ground, but we had like a 30 minute conversation about sort of them wanting to do something focused, particularly on the re-entry re population. Uh, there's a, thank you so much to both of you for answering that question. Uh, and it's, it's very relevant considering that we also have a uh, health equity and criminal justice um, uh, uh, public health concentration. And so many of our students are very interested in um, individuals that are re-entering and uh, reducing re recidivism. Uh, there is another question related to funding. And so as we went through, um, you know, listening to all three of you all, it seems like the funding sources for the guaranteed income um, pilots in each uh, city are, are different. And um, the question from uh, one of our at attendees is how are these programs typically funded and what do you say to people who um, might feel they have to pay more taxes as a result of such a program and if it becomes statewide? Yeah, no. Um, so many programs were philanthropically funded. Uh, Stockton was philanthropically funded. Oakland was philanthropically funded. But what's been exciting, particularly with the American Rescue Plan, is that so many of the pilots are actually government funded. So we have like the three largest programs in the country are all government funded. Um, L.A. County, $40 million guaranteed income, all funded from county government. L.A. City, $38 million, all funded public dollars. Um, Chicago City. $39 million, all public. Chicago County, $42 million, all public. So for me, it's been incredible to see sort of how by so many mayors exhibiting courage and doing it, they've de-risked it in a way where folks aren't worried. Like you had Mayor Steinberg talking about, we just put $2 million in for a different guaranteed income program focused on artists. Like so many people are putting real public dollars in, in into this, which is super exciting. And I mean, yeah, I, I think to the question of taxes, as someone who is paying a lot of <laughs> is paying taxes, I would say that, I mean, you're going to pay tax, like, like, we're already paying for poverty. We're already paying for lack. We're already, we spend so much money on not solving an issue and then being upset about it. So I think this is actually more so looking at it as a tax. I look at it, look at it as an investment. 
in, into the future and into a more safe, more prosperous um, community. But yeah, resources have to come from somewhere, but it also doesn't have to be an individual tax. You can do things like a data dividend in terms of the data we all produce that creates trillions of dollars of value for tech companies. Just conversations about we should own some of that. And that could be almost like a, a form of, 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 of personal or, or guaranteed income. There's conversation about sort of descheduling, descheduling marijuana at the federal level, times at the federal level, and using some of that tax revenue to fund some sort of robust um, guaranteed income. There's talks around kind of carbon, like, like there, there, there's ways to do it um, that, that, that will make it have maximum impact and minimum um, hurt on folks who are already struggling. Um, in, in, in this economy. So that's the, that's not the question. The question is the will as to do we want to do it. And I and I do believe I I, I recall someone saying kind of the the human the human cost of of this. And if there is a cost benefit analysis, and many of our students have have heard of that, um, there's a cost to emergency room use, there's a cost to um, you know other public services that are used. Um, as stopgap measures um, by people that, you know, are in extreme poverty. And I, I do believe that, you know, there, there will have to come some, some, become some sort of evaluation of uh, the cost benefit of, uh, of these programs uh, to reducing the cost in other places in, in, in these cities. So thank you so much for, for that answer. Dr. Cummings? Yeah, no, I um, I really appreciate that, and I, I think hopefully our public health students who are, are listening are appreciating this this conversation, and we do appreciate you. You said you were nerding out, Eleanor, but um, you know, uh, presenting sort of the the different evaluation plans and you know what you call the quasi experimental research methods so important that actually does give. Um, our students an idea of these are ways that public health students and public health practitioners can get involved that, you know, in terms of the research, in terms of looking at the, these evaluation methods, because there, there are many um, of which include a cost benefit analysis. So I think we're kind of putting together the future for how we help to commit, uh, continue to document this really important work that you all have launched. And um, we're certainly looking forward to what this looks like. Um, you know, after it, 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 it comes into law and is no longer a pilot. So I do have a quick question before we get to some of the other questions and understanding um, that your time is a little short also, um, Eleanor. What is the timeline in, in terms of these two phases that you identified? So for our first, our phase one cohort, that wraps up at the end of this year. So. You know, we are in active conversations. Um, I mean, both we'd love to do what Stockton did, where they're able to secure um, some additional funding and extend it, um, but also working to, you know, prepare folks, um, make sure there's access to other resources, and um, yeah, talk to folks about just the transition that is coming. Um, the second one, I believe, wraps up in May of next year. And again, you know, there's sort of this bittersweet. I think all of us just have, you know, a little concern of her hearts about the, the off ramping, but are also really excited to see the evaluation results. Um, and I think just as a, as a practitioner, that for me, this was very interesting as a government worker to be uh, launching a program that was also a, a research study. Um, so I think there were a lot of learnings there. And same with for our community members as we engaged with folks on kind of, how we want to target, target it and how we want to move forward. I realize I'm branching into a separate <laughs> issue, but um, I think it's just interesting as students are thinking about where they're moving to, um, you know, that, that kind of connection between academia and um, serving community is, is an interesting place and making sure things that are done collaboratively and transparently, and also that the results, they we're also thinking about how do we share this information out with folks as it, as it comes out. Yeah, no, thank you so much for that. It looked like uh, Mayor Tubbs, you had, uh, you wanted to say something in addition to. No, I'm sorry, my, my door dash was acting weird and not losing <laughs> my food, but it needs to, so I'm sorry. No worries, no worries. Uh, Dr. Wilson, do you wanna take the next question? 
Uh oh, you're muted. <laughs> Sure, there were a couple of questions related to kind of the stabilization of the cost of homes. Uh, and, and one particular um, attendee um, asked, you know, with companies like Zillow buying up properties and driving up prices, um, how do you stabilize the cost of homes at, in an effort to um, address um, issues of poverty within uh, cities? Are there policies? How, how would you all propose um, yeah, no, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief and defer to the policy expert, but um, from a, an outside looking in, it, I mean, we have to have a robust discussion about rent control. We have to cap how much rent is able to rise um, in, in, in a given year, given that income is not rising with rent. Um, we have to have more uh, housing that's affordable, um, meaning housing that's affordable for the people who currently live in the community. I remember being mayor of Stockton and they always wanted to build half a million dollar houses. And I'm like, that's cool for people that can afford half a million dollar houses. But if the median income is 45,000, we need houses that are 200, $300,000 for the folks who live in Stockton. We have to build, we have to build it all because I want everyone to, to be able to afford to live here. And we, part of that is that it's not profitable given some of the other regulations in California. So government has to build more housing and we have to allow government to build more affordable housing by right. Um, I think we have to get you get rid of um, we have to do some zoning reform and sort of maybe single house zoning should in the 21st century. Maybe that's just not a thing we need. We need more multifamily. We need to go higher, et cetera, to, to, to get more people in. Um, uh, yeah, those are just some of the things off, off the top of my head um, that seem like things that have to be done uh, if we're going to if, if we really care about the issue of housing in California not being affordable. Oh, the right to counsel. And we also need to have some sort of right to counsel, um, particularly with the amount of evictions. We know that those who get evicted, if they have a lawyer, they're most likely not to be evicted. And having some sort of right to counsel for folks facing eviction or some access to legal aid also seems like part of that solution. Thank you so much. Ms. Buchan? Yeah, I mean, I was just going to echo that. And I, you know, I really wish that Mayor Schaaf was on here because this is an issue that she is super passionate about. And you know, we'll continue to work on um, even when she is not mayor of Oakland. I mean, a lot of times we talk about the three P's. So production, you know, a, a lot of the gap in the Bay Area is we've seen a huge boom in the economy, a ton of people coming in and a lot of not in my backyards, a lot of regulations and not enough housing being built. Um, so production preservation, making sure for the existing affordable housing um, that we are preserving that and investing in that and subsidizing um, more affordable housing and protect protection. Um, that's what Mayor Tubbs spoke to also. It's, you know, it's like a both and, and we need market rate, we need subsidized affordable housing. Um, you know, she's really passionate about um, working on some statewide efforts to lower the voter threshold for housing bonds. I mean, we really just need more public resources to go in and fill that gap um, between, um, you know, folks who have very limited resources, right? So we're, we're trying to lift the floor for folks and we need to make the housing more affordable with some more public dollars. So, um, you know, that's always top of mind for us, honestly, in Oakland. And I think for most folks in the Bay Area, because we have seen um, just, tons of folks being forced out um, who grew up here, who have family here. Who, um, so yeah, it's something we think about a lot and um, there's not a, an easy silver bullet to solve it right now. Great, thank you both for not only participating today, but also providing such uh, a robust conversation and um, kind of elucidating this, con this uh, this particular topic to both our students and the audience in general. This is, I think, a topic that not enough people are aware of um, or aware of the benefits. Um, I think with regards to um, a statewide uh, guaranteed income movement, we'll be uh, waiting to hear back from you, Mer Meredith Tubbs, as you work with uh, Governor Gavin Newsom. Uh, and, and perhaps you can come back and give us uh, a report on, on where we stand as um, a state. Um, 
And so we're going to wrap up today's session um, with loads of thanks, and hopefully we can have you all back um, at another um, point in time to give us an update. Um, and we'd love to hear about other uh, cities and states as well as they implement the Guaranteed Income Program. Thank you both. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate being included. Thank you. Eleanor, tell Mayor Schaff you <laughs> did, it, did the thing. And I will, <laughs> along with lots of fluids and lots of rest. <laughs> yeah, but you tell her, like, listen, take your time. I got this. <laughs> Yeah, we really appreciate you filling in. I know it was a last minute and boy, you are quite the champ. So Aww. thanks all. I appreciate it. I appreciate the support. And thank you, Mayor Tubbs. We're looking forward to, to those books. Um, can't wait to get our hands on those copies. So appreciate you. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Have a good night. Take care all. Bye-bye.